Put away these things, and you'll be with Christ in glory. Pick up these things, and you will not be. Plain and simple. Well, good morning. <laughs> that little boy is a nut and a half. Anyway. Yeah. Well, God is good. Amen. And He is a blessing to us. Today we are starting in chapter 3 of the book of Colossians. And this is a continuation of the section, A New Life in Christ. We are called to have a new life in Christ. We are called to, to once we become believers, we are called then to change our ways and be better by the ability and trust of God. So let's go there, and when we have turned there, say amen. Amen. Put that on, take it off, because I'm going to read. Starting in verse 1. If you then were raised with Christ, desire those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of earth, things on earth. For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you shall also appear with Him in glory. Therefore put to death the parts of your earthly nature, sexual immorality, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. You also once walked in these when you lived in them, but now you must also put away all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy and filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie one to another, since you have put off the old nature with its deeds, and have embraced the, nat the new nature, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of Him who created it, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to take part in this of, of your word. Father, I pray that, Lord, that you would give us anointing to hear and understand and in, apply these things to our lives. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If we are believers... We said this last week. Starting in verse 16. So from now on, we do not regard anything according to the flesh. Yes, though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we do not regard Him as such from now on. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Look, all things have become new. Now, that's exactly what Colossians is saying. All things should become new. It says, if, then, if you then were raised with Christ, desire those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. So, when we are a believer in Christ, we should set our affections on things above. We should be wanting to read God's Word. We should be desiring to follow God in everything that we do. We should desire God's will for our life and not our own. Does that mean it's easy? No. 
We talked this morning in Sunday school about counting the cost. This kind of life costs you something. This kind of life, life costs you sometimes, for some, a lot. For sometimes, not so much. But it still costs something. It still costs something. Some of us will have to, will have to and have had to walk away from friendships and relationships. Sometimes jobs. Sometimes financial things. But there is a cost to following Christ. Set on the things above. That means if we are not doing God's will, but we're comfortable in doing what we're doing, even though it's not God's will, we're to change that. If we are doing apart from God's will and say we're a Christian and God says do my will, we are to change that. We are to count the cost and change that. Set your sight on the things above. Now, for you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your old life should be dead to you. Your old way of thinking should be dead to you. Yes, we're going to have our days. We're going to have our, our times of going back to holding grudges or tail bearing or, or whatever the case. We're going to have those days, but they shouldn't, they shouldn't be a part of who we are anymore. They should be dead to us. Those things. Why? Because he says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you also shall appear with, with him in glory. That's why we change. That's why we apply the scripture. That's why we apply this new life in Christ. It's not for status. It's not for being out in front. It's not for any of that. But it is for the opportunity of being with Christ at the end. That's our reward. That's our reward. People that tell you, oh, it'll be so pie in the sky by and by, and I use that term a lot, but people say that a lot. Your life will be so much easier if you just give, it, give your life to Christ. More times than not, it's not easier. It's harder. That's why you have to count the cost. That's why you have to understand that you may have to walk away from people and relationships and friends. You may have to. That's why you have to count the cost. And it goes on and it goes on and that is the goal, is to be with Christ. Our walking away, our counting the cost and staying with the Lord can bring people to the Lord. I brought this up this morning in Sunday school. What, what happens if we follow Christ without counting the cost? We have family pressures. We have job pressures. We have relationship pressures. If you really loved me, you wouldn't go to church on Sunday. If you really loved me, you would put me first before your church time. And it's not church time, it's relationship with Christ. There's a difference. There is a difference. And that's where you have to count the cost. You may have to walk away from a relationship for a time so that God can work in that relationship. And therefore, that loss then, in the end, will be our gain and that person's gain if they follow Christ because of our example. It's all about example. He goes on. <clears throat> this is a hard one, but this is a command by Paul. Therefore, put, away, put to death the parts of your earthly nature, the things that drive us, earthly nature, the sin nature. Put away these things. Sexual immorality, uncleanness, inordinate affection. This is a new translation, but it's talking about same gender affection. Put away those things. Evil desires, any evil desire that you might have. It might be, I want that car or I want the television or it might be I want that man or I want that woman or I want that relationship evil desires put that away covetousness same kind of thing put that away all that's idolatry idolatry is sin 
There's a lot of things we can put under the umbrella of idolatry. And idolatry is sin. God said it right in Exodus 20. I will have no other gods before me. The worship of other gods is idolatry. And other gods can take the form of covetousness. In many forms. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. Because of our desire to do that which we want to do, because we want to be comfortable, we want to live in a life of sin, we want to live in a life of, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it, regardless of what God says, regardless of what pastor says, regardless of what anybody says, I'm going to do what I want to do. You're in disobedience to God, and therefore the wrath of God is upon you. It's not my words. It's right here. The wrath of God is upon you. You may not find it immediately, but it's there. We are to follow God. We are to put away the old way of thinking. 1 Corinthians 5.17 Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Or becoming new. If you look at the Greek, the word for that, the translation of that Greek is all things are becoming new. All things are becoming new. Things are changing in the way we think, the way we react, the way we do things. All things are becoming new. And that's important. We should be coming new all the time. Not that we have to repent all the time, but we should be living a fervent life in God, experiencing the river of life. And I say that not as a jargon, but if we have God in our life, it's like a river of life. It's like, it's like the things that we, we should have every single day. It's like spiritual food. If I think about it, I remember when I was a kid, I used to do woodworking out in the garage and I, I wasn't as talented as Jim and Wayne but I was I was I would take old furniture and I would refinish them and minor fixes you know nothing that I built I mean I, I built a couple things in shop but they don't pale in comparison but anyway I remember it was a hot summer day and I'd been outside in the garage all day stripping a waterbed frame and you know, sanding and all this stuff. And it was hot. It was probably 90 degrees outside in the shade. And I was in the garage doing all this. And I'd been there out there and I'd been working, working, working. And you know what? My brother was there. My brother Michael, he was there visiting. He was home from the blind school and he was there visiting. And he was dumping water from one bucket into another for some reason. And just the sound of that water dumping into that bucket, my mouth started to water. I was thirsty. I needed that water. I needed that refreshment. I needed those kinds of things. That's what a relationship with Christ should be for us every single day. When we sit down to read the Word, or when we sit down to pray, or when we sit down to to come into God's house on a Sunday morning or we sit down on a Sunday night and do Bible study on Facebook. Our life should yearn for that knowledge and yearn for that relationship because it's like living, living water life to us. That's what he's talking about here. We put away those things. We understand that those things bring death and not life. The Word of God brings life Jesus said He'd come, that we'd have life and that more abundantly. It means we could really, 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 really live. God said that, not me. We are to have life, and God brings that life, not our old life. How many of us have been a Christian for... I was a Christian for 20 years. How many people have been a Christian for longer than 20 years? Right? Right? How about shorter than 20 years? Do you remember what it was like before? Oh, yes. Was there life there? Was there peace there? No. Was there security there? No. I can remember back too. 
And none of that was there. Jesus brings life, security, peace, comfort, all of those things that we didn't have before. So that's why he says, put away these things because these things bring death. If we are partaking in these things when Jesus comes, we won't be with Him in glory. It says it right there, beginning of the chapter. If you then were raised with Christ, desire those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. What are the things of the earth? Sexual immorality, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil desire and covetousness. Put away those things. And then he says, For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you shall be with Him in glory, or appear with Him in glory. Put away these things, and you'll be with Christ in glory. Pick up these things and you will not be. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. This isn't really theological study. This is sentence structure, context, uh, grammar, these kinds of things. This is English, right? This is how you study English. You do this and you'll get this. You don't do this and you won't. Simple. Now, that's not to say that we have to be perfect in all these things. We have to strive to be perfect. We have days in our life where we do, yes, pick up uncleanness of all kinds. We pick up um, evil desires, covetousness. We have those kinds of things. We have, the, you know, maybe even in some ways sexual immorality. We'll have those days. We live in a human body that is on a sin-fallen earth that we are tempted. But it's what we do with those things after that happens. Do we sit in it and we wallow in it? Or do we ask for forgiveness and move on? That's the question. We should ask for forgiveness and move on. Because of these things, when we do not repent, that's why I always say, keep a short account with the Lord. Repent every single day. If we do not repent, if, if, if we do not, these, the, 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 the wrath of God is upon you. If you do these things, the wrath of God is upon you, and you will be apart from God in eternity. You also once walked in these. Paul is not saying that they were always perfect. He's saying, I recognize this is who you were. This is what you were doing. Just like God says, He knows me. He knows who I was. He knows who you were. You walked in these things. And you lived in them. Didn't just walk in them. You lived in them. This was your way of thinking. This was your way of being, he's telling them. And God tells us, this is was you, who you were. This was part of you. This was how you were. But then Jesus came and made you new. Therefore, all things should continue to become new. You walked in these when you, and you lived in them, but now you must also put away all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy language out of your mouth. Now he's saying, I've got to put away all this uncleanness and all this stuff. Now I've got to put away all this other stuff too. Well, all this other stuff is part of the top stuff. All this bottom, this top stuff is uh, inside this bottom stuff, which is manifestations of the top stuff. 
If you are sexually immoral, if you are unclean, if you are inordinate, if your uh, desire is evil and you have covetousness, these kinds of things will come out of your mouth. Malice, anger, wrath, blasphemy, filthy language. Those things will happen. And then we look at, go deeper and we say, what does it say in the scripture about things that come out of our mouth? What does James say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So that means not only is our speech bad, but ultimately the root of the cause is the heart. The heart is bad. We have a heart problem. Therefore, our heart must be right with God before our speech and our, and our attitudes and way of thinking will ever be right with God. Our heart must be right. Our heart must be right. If our heart is right, we will be putting these things away and trying our best to live in God as God would want us to live. We have a heart problem if we have a problem with these. Check your heart. Now, do not lie one to another since you have put off the old nature with its deeds. Another mouth thing. Do not lie to one to another. What does the Bible say about liars? There is a special place for liars in the, liars in the lake of fire. A special place in hell for liars. So do not lie one to another. If you're lying to one to another, then there's a heart problem. Right? Now, since you've put off the nature of its, since you've put off the old nature with its deeds and have embraced the new nature and renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created it, where there's neither Jew or Greek, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. If we are following Jesus Christ in the way that we should, we embrace God and His will and His character and all of these things, we don't see others as sinners and saints. We see brothers and sisters and those who have yet to come to know the Lord. How many people have heard the term sinners? Those people are just sinners. Heathens. Right? Churches say that. Pastors say that. And that might be true. But if we are following in God and putting off the old nature, using those words in a context, isn't that kind of malice? But we are also to love them. Right? We are to love our neighbors, whether they're believers or not. We are to love our family members, whether they're believers or not. Because Christ loved us and gave His life for us. And therefore, once we have given our life to Christ, then all of these things should be changing. Do you see the pattern here? There is a distinct pattern here. Now, it says there is no Greek or Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, which would be to us today those who are outside of the faith, right? Slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. So if you have brothers and sisters in Christ that are of different nationalities, different uh, faith systems. You know, there's not, there's not a, um, a code that says Pentecostals got it all right and everybody else is wrong. There's not a code that says United Brethren people are right and everybody else has got it wrong. There's not a code that says Baptists are right and everybody else is wrong. There's not a code for any of that. The code is, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Have you been born again? Then there is no Baptist, Pentecostal, United Brethren, uh, Catholic, whatever. There is none of that. There only is brothers and sisters in Christ. 
That's what he's saying. There's no labels. There's no labels. We're all brothers and sisters. If we have come to know Jesus, and if we have not yet come to know Jesus, that is then our mission field. Right? If we go outside this door, and we go down the street and down back around here like I do every day, there's houses all over this town. Not so many people, but there's more and more people than more houses than people, I'm sure. But is, is every one of the people that is in this town, are they believers in Christ? Do they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? How about Cessna Park? Is everybody in that town a believer? How about Sheldon? Is everybody in that town a believer? No. No. How about Wellington? No. How about Milford? No. So that's our mission fields. That's our mission fields. Right? Cessna Park, Wellington, Milford, Claytonville, Hoopston, all of these areas around us. They're not a mission field if everyone knows Jesus. Right? They're a mission field if there's people there that don't know Jesus. And we're trying our best. I know we are. Jim's trying his hardest, getting cards every week, handing out cards. And, and you know, I'm there in Sheldon talking to people and ministering to people and, and trying to be there in Watsika and everywhere else. And I know we're all trying, but let's not give up. Let's not give up. We might not see every head in, this, in every pew full in here, but let's not give up. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. We need people to know Jesus. That's just like what it says in the Scripture, that God is not a respecter of person. Those people that we consider unlovely, or those that have yet to know Jesus, how do we look at those people? Are they not worth our time? They should be, because they were worth His time. They're worth His time. And for some of us, it is a comfort zone issue. And that's something we have to grow in. I had to grow in it. I had to grow in it, and I'm still growing in it. There are things that I have, uh, God has wanted me to do in the past that I'm doing now that I would not have been comfortable doing five years ago, ten years ago. But I had to grow in it. Right? So God is not respecter of person. We should not be respecter of persons. We should not have malice toward the brethren. That's basically what he's saying here. Put away those things and allow God to move. Christ is all, in, is all and in all. All believers. If they've asked Jesus to be their Lord and Savior and they are sincere, it does not matter what the do top of the door says or the sign says. It does not matter who they are as long as they follow Christ. Are they following Christ? And if they are, they're brethren. You might disagree on doctrine, but look, Peter and Paul disagreed on doctrine. They were still brothers in Christ. Understand? Am I making sense? We all have a part to play in this thing called Christian walk and Christian life. My challenge for you is to ask God to show you where to grow, how to grow. And the thing about that is, once you've done that and God says, here's where I want you to grow, here's what I want you to do, it's your job then to take that knowledge and apply that knowledge to your life. God might just say, hey, I want you to grow in reading your Bible. 
Or I want you to grow in understanding who I am first. Then you have to apply that. And you have to say, how do I apply knowing God better? You apply knowing God better by taking time in the Word. And praying. And coming to church. Coming to Sunday school. Hint, 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 hint. Coming to Sunday school. And learning about God. And watching the Facebook Bible study on Sunday night. Hint, 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 730. Learn about God. Right? Amen. We have to do these things. In order, we have to have the foundation of the Word of God before we can do anything else. Point blank simple. You want to have these things go away in your life. The malice and all that stuff. You want to have all that stuff gone. You have to have a good foundation in the Word of God. And a good foundation in a relationship with God. That makes it a whole lot easier. You're not going to do it in and of yourself. You're only going to do it with Jesus. And that's it. So that's the challenge. Find out where God wants you to grow. If it is something as simple as get in your Bible, then get in your Bible. You need to be doing that anyway. But if it's something that simple, do it. You don't have to go out and talk to people at this point. You just have to get into your Bible. And then God will then, once you're faithful with that, God will then give you something else. Now, once you know the Word and have a good relationship, God will give you the ability and the boldness to say, hey, I'm going to go out and talk to somebody about my relationship with God. And then once you're faithful with that, then you begin to grow. And then what happens is growth in us then begins growth in the church. And then we teach others and then they go out and the same thing happens. See, it's not programs. It's not, it's not uh, gimmicks. It's just knowing what God wants. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. Make sense? Can we commit to that? At least knowing, trying to know what God wants? And growing in that? Can we commit to that? I've committed to that. And it's wonderful. God is great. Amen? Amen. Better than good. I think our words don't do justice to what God is. So He's greater than great. And that's even don't do justice to God. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You today for Your Word. Thank You, Lord, for Your challenge. Thank You, Lord, for our, our obedience to You as, Lord, we walk in this week. Help us to walk in obedience to You God, I pray that you administer to us and bless us. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Is that song your pledge? Trust Jesus. Can we trust Jesus this week? I hope we can. I pray that we can. I pray that your life is enriched as you go on this week. And that God is with you as you move from day to day. That you feel His presence. And that amazing grace is there. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. God be with you. Bless you this week. May He ever give you mercies every morning. And bless you every day. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Ah. Uh...